All right. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to call the Temecula City Council meeting of February 27th to order. Uh, Claire Maxey, are you in the back there still? There you are. Thank you so much. It was uh, beautiful prelude music tonight. Appreciate you coming out. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Nagar, would you provide our invocation and flag salute for us this evening? It would be my honor. Please stand with me. Let's just have a little word of prayer. Heavenly Father, um, first we thank you for the ability to gather, express our opinions, speak in liberty with no fear. Um, we realize that everything that is created was created by your hand and that you control everything. We ask, Lord, that we uh, are obedient to uh, what you would have us do tonight. We ask for wisdom, and we ask for insight, and we do all these things in the name of your Son. Amen. If you would face the flag with me, recognize the principles for which it stands, and say with me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. Good evening, Madam City Clerk. Can we have the roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Camachero? Here. Councilmember Edwards? Here. Councilmember Nagar? Good evening. Councilmember Stewart? Here. Mayor Ron? I am here. All right, to start off, we have two presentations this evening. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Spencer Mack to the podium to uh, join us here and talk a little bit about your project for Eagle Scout. Mr. Mack, good evening. Hi. How are you doing? Great. So about my, my Eagle Scout project? Yes, sir. So um, it, took, it took my dad and I a while to find a place that actually kind of fit what I was looking for. But uh, we um, decided to go to Santa Rosa Plateau. And the, uh, the ranger there offered us a project for the, the starting was like 300 feet of fencing because um, people were um, going into some reserved areas and they couldn't really keep them out. So, I mean, it, it was really, it was simple. I mean, it's just the planning was the hardest part, obviously. But, um, I mean, to make a long story short, I guess, uh, my, my troop and I, we um, spent a full day installing fencing. fencing. And, uh, I mean, I raised money by doing, um, like, a garage sale and recycling and all that type of stuff. And, um, <laughs> and I think, I personally think it was a good project, you know. I mean, all my troop went together, and we all worked as a good team. So I think it was, uh, I think it was a success, in my opinion. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Nagar. Spencer, I see that you remember of Troop 301. Yes, sir. A lot of honorable Eagle Scouts have come out of Troop 301, mm -hmm. and that uh, is one heck of a good Boy Scout troop uh, uh, that have just lasted the years here in, in Temecula. I, got um, I have a certificate of achievement um, recognizing uh, your promotion to Eagle Scout, but we have something else for you. Um, we have commissioned a special pin. I remember this was uh, uh, Marianne Edwards brought this to our attention, that you can only get here in Temecula that we only give away to Eagle Scouts who've attained your rank. Mm -hmm. So yes, so it's our pleasure to give you um, a pin. I think maybe um, out of all the uh, Eagle Scouts around, perhaps we've given away 30 over the years, something like that. Yeah. So it's, it's highly prized, oh. but you've earned it. Thank you so much. I You're appreciate very welcome. it. Oh, sorry, the <laughs> Eagle Scouts on the left hand had to. Oh, thank you so oh, much. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, it is. I didn't know that. All right. Thank you, everyone. I have no evidence sure, the left hand, uh, there otherwise, sure the but people be proud of that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we have more Eagle Scouts per capita in the city of Temecula than any other city in the country. In the world. Yeah, we do. I don't, I don't have any evidence to prove that, but <laughs> I feel like that's true, so we'll just go with that. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Roger Alfaro, if you wouldn't mind coming to the podium and providing us a uh, presentation on CAFR. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Roger Alfaro. I'm a partner with Vavernick Trine Dane Company. And uh, I had the lead responsibility for completing the audit for the last fiscal year. The fiscal year ended June 30th, 2017. And our audit process relates to the financial statements of the city of Temecula. In particular, they prepare a comprehensive annual financial report. So to tell you a little bit about that process, 
as your external auditor, our role is to express an opinion on the financial statements to determine that they're fairly presented. Uh, it's important to note that management is responsible for the underlying accounting records as well as the financial statements themselves. The audit process took place over a number of different months. It began in April of last year, at which point we did our risk assessment field work. Uh, the risk assessment work or the focus of our efforts at that point in time is to understand the key internal controls that the city has in place to produce accurate uh, financial statements and financial information. As part of that process, we're also looking at controls that the city has in place to mitigate or prevent errors, fraudulent financial reporting, misappropriation of assets, or non-compliance with laws and regulations. Uh, as an example, some of the things that we consider, we take a look at the revenue recognition process here at the city in terms of how revenues are earned, how cash is handled, received, reconciled. We also take a look at the controls that the city has in place for disbursements and payments, uh, including payroll, and then ultimately the financial system itself and the financial reporting process. Once the books are closed, so sometime after June 30th, last year was in September and October, we came out and we actually do a number of different procedures to validate the account balances, as well as the activities that are reported in the financial statements. The types of procedures that we employ or utilize include third-party confirmations, analytical procedures, uh, sampling transactions on a test basis, looking at underlying agreements, invoices, contracts, and a variety of other documentation to gather the evidence that ultimately what we're trying to do is validate account balances and the activities that occurred during the year. Based on this evidence that we've gathered, we've issued what's referred to as an unmodified opinion on the financial statements or on the CAFR. <coughs> the, uh, an unmodified opinion is also referred to as a clean opinion. And it's important to note that that's the highest level of assurance you can achieve in a financial statement audit. A clean opinion means that the city has uh, reported its financial position as well as its changes in financial position for the fiscal year in accordance with the appropriate accounting policies uh, and basically that they're fairly presented. In addition, as part of the audit process, we, through our internal control understanding, we also issue a separate report which is referred to as a government auditing standards internal control over financial reporting. It is not an opinion, but that document indicates that there were no material weaknesses that came up as a result of the work that we've performed, nor did we encounter any instances of non-compliance. Again, that is the, uh, the, a clean report with respect to the internal control. Because the city also incurs federal expenditures and, and expenditures related to federal grants, it's also required to undergo a specific audit for certain major federal programs for this fiscal year. That's referred to as a single audit. And in that process, or in that scope of work, we actually perform testing to determine whether the city has complied with federal terms uh, and conditions re relative to specific grants during the fiscal year. And in that scope of work, we've issued a clean opinion on compliance as well. And no material weaknesses were noted with respect to our testing of select federal programs for the fiscal year. We're pleased to report that we did not have any disagreements with management with respect to accounting, auditing, or financial reporting matters, nor did we have any difficulties in the conduct, in the conduct of our field work. Uh, city staff was professional in providing us access to the documentation that we need to complete our work, as well as access to employees within, uh, within the city to, to complete our scope of work. And so with that, uh, we appreciate serving as your external independent auditor. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Big round of applause for Ms. Hennessy. Thank you so much for keeping us uh, by the book and doing such a wonderful job. This is not the first time we've uh, received that uh, accolade, I'm sure. How many years has it been? Since inception. <laughs> well, yeah. says a All lot about our... Uh, our financial accountability for the city. Thank you so much. All right. Um, let's see. With that said, do we have any public comment? Mr. Mayor, we do. We have two public comments on non-agendized items. All right. <clears throat> Total of 30 minutes is provided for members of the public to address City Council on items that appear within the consent calendar 
or a matter not listed on the agenda. Each speaker is limited to three minutes if the speaker chooses to address the City Council on an item listed on the consent calendar or a matter not listed on the agenda. Request to speak form may be filed uh, or filled out and filed with the City Clerk prior to the City Council addressing public comments and the consent calendar. Once the speaker is called to speak, please come forward, state your name for the record. All public hearing or council business items on the agenda, request to speak form may be filed with the city clerk prior to the city council addressing that item. Each speaker for that is limited to five minutes. Can we have the first speaker, please? Mr. Mayor, the first speaker on non-agendized items is Robert Boyd to be followed by Ms. Miller. Mr. Boyd, good evening. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council members and everyone else, I'm uh, Robert Boyd and I'm here on behalf of the Temecula Valley Garden Club to bring awareness to a program called Penny Pines. Uh, the National Forest covers 20% of the uh, 20 million acres in, in California and actually 20% of the area of California, about uh, the size of, uh, of the state of South Carolina. It's not only a great recreational resource, but it's also really vital to wildlife and also to protection of our watershed. Penny Pines is a group that was started in San Francisco after a major fire near there in 1941 by the uh, San Francisco Sportswomen's Association. And uh, the purpose was to collect donations to be used in conjunction with the National Forest Service to uh, replant forests that were decimated by wildfire, <coughs> pestilence, and, uh, and disease. And uh, at that time, uh, they could buy a seedling for a penny. And uh, they decided at that time also that they were going to, uh, it took like 680 seedlings to plant an acre. And it, they called 10 acres a, uh, a, a plantation. And so it took 6,800 seedlings to, to plant a plantation that cost $68. And over the years, of course, the price of seedlings has gone up and the cost to plant them has gone up, but they've kept the, seed, or the plantation price at $68. And uh, the, the uh, Garden Club, along with several other organizations, including Boy Scouts and, and several others, uh, collect money on a monthly basis and donate to Penny Pines, but we also have an opportunity where uh, individuals can make a donation. They can buy a plantation for $68, or they can make a, uh, just a monetary uh, contribution of any amount, because any amount is, is certainly help. Um, the uh, national, uh, Penny Pines is a national program, but all of the money that's donated in Temecula is uh, uh, saved for forests that are uh, in need in the area, and in California and close to, to our location. So uh, what I've done is to put together a donation packet because, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to ask for donations tonight and clear the room with everybody running home to get their checkbook. Uh, so I put together a little packet here that uh, contains an envelope addressed to the person who collects the donations at the Garden Club. Uh, one of the uh, uh, business card for the Garden Club tells you a little bit about it, a uh, synopsis of my presentation and the sheet that's used for uh, making the donations. Uh, this presentation was made in Marietta by one of our members, and uh, they managed to collect $5 in cash at the meeting, but uh, they also got two <laughs> plantations donated. So uh, I'm going to chip in six bucks because I don't really want, don't want us to be one up by Marietta, and I'm hoping that some other people may choose to do that as well. I've left uh, 18 copies of this uh, with our city clerk, uh, Randy Joel Olson, and I really implore people consider making a, a contribution to uh, Penny Pines. They can be made uh, uh, to, you'll get a certificate if you make a contribution. And if you make a monetary contribution, I would say put your uh, contact information on it so that you can be acknowledged by the Garden Club. And uh, in the case of contributions that are made uh, to, re to remember someone who's passed away, uh, they, they, make, they put a plant someplace uh, near the, the plantation. I, I've never seen the plant. We have, a, we have a plantation, but I haven't gone to try to find the plaque, so. All right. Yeah, so thank if, you for uh, indulging me. If you me. could make sure the city clerk receives those materials, that'd be she great. She has them already. Mr. Nagar. Yeah, quick question. So, yes. so a plantation consists of 
One, a plantation right now consists of approximately 350 uh, seedlings, and the seedlings are uh, they cover a little less than an acre. They, originally, they had 680 pine seedlings per acre, but now they're planting things other than pines, and they're also very careful to plant the correct indigenous <coughs> species that are uh, have been decimated. So they they have volunteers, hundreds of volunteers who collect acorns, uh, pine cones, and all of those things, and they're very careful about screening it. We had a presentation by one of the rangers from the San Bernardino Forest, and uh, they're careful to re replant the plantation with the correct things. And how much is a plantation? Plantation is still sixty-eight dollars. We've kept the price the same all through the years. It just doesn't. And, buy as much. And who's doing the planting? Your garden club? No, the planting is all done by the National Forest Service, and the seedlings are uh, grown in National Forest Service uh, facilities. Okay, so we won't be outdone by Murrieta. Um, personally speaking, um, me and my colleagues here will we'll take three plantations. All right. Okay, and I'll work it out with my colleagues later, but it's personal, not coming from the city. Okay, okay. so, yes, yes. Uh, and we'll work it out, but uh, if you can make sure the um, the city clerk has the information. She'll also give you my information, and we'll make sure you get your three plantations from us. Okay, very good. Thank okay. you very much. All right, you got it. Thank you. Neener, Neener. We have our next speaker, please. Our final speaker on non agendized items is Ms. Miller. You can fill out a slip and come up, it's okay. All right, that was very uplifting to know that we are replanting the earth and I wish that uh, we weren't paving it anywhere. We could have spent our time, technology, energy on respecting the intense power of the built-in annihilators of the planetary substrata infrastructure called volcanoes and earthquakes and ionic bonding of the upper atmospheric gases that result in hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. Instead, people have arranged more superficial venues from distractions like sports and parties. The Bible says in Romans not to set one day above another, which means no holidays, no days off from educational experiences unless ordained in historical scriptures. The Festival of the Booth is an ordained day where people share what they've made or harvested. We could have spent all our science on not contributing to the overheating of our planet from use of fossil fuels, which aggravates the condition of the magma in the ground by overheating the rocks around it. If there is technology that causes the Earth to turn into a black hole produced from CERN, which is the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Switzerland, then why wasn't that used for collapsing volcanoes unto it themselves? Volcanoes can cause trouble with that sulfur that covers the sun's ability to reach the vegetation. Instead, CERN is used for weaponry against aliens and others. If aliens had wanted to annihilate humanity, they would have already accomplished that. Instead, they have entered every facet of government by possessing the minds of elected, appointed, and employees that would work for such thoughtless paving over of the land for profit and false economy, not for higher quality living that preserves the land. People cannot give up. Continue to speak out against too much development, especially against overbuilt out Temecula and the traffic tie ups for reoccurring on Winchester and I 15. We just can't allow more traffic stream from housing tracks coming from wine country. Leon Road, the west side behind Old Town, will be covered with Section 8 housing. Any traffic that's on the Mountain Lions territory. Did any of you come here knowing that? we would still be speaking about that, and you can still vote against that. Yes, I heard a yes. We are still relying, rallying against Roy Poe expansion, which will bring in 2,000 more houses, and there will be people on the city hall porch protesting against this. The altar, 1,750 homes and apartments, that's the mountain line territory who will not be tranquilized and move, move, save the wild things, the chaparral, the food chain and their habitats. We heard you were going to trank and move them. We'll not stand for that. All right, we Ms. want them Ms. left Miller, here. Your, your time is up. I apologize. Thank you.
Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, that concludes public comments on non-agendized items. We have no further public comments. Okay, wonderful. Uh, do we have any city council reports? Seeing Mr. Nagar in the queue. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief if uh, staff could go ahead and put up the slide. Circus is coming to town uh, March 8th, and um, for about the fifth or sixth year in, the, in a row, we've uh, always celebrated opening night as Autism Task Force Night. And uh, there's a little story behind that. I'll tell it real quickly. When I was 15 years old, I was able to uh, join the Ringling Brothers in Barnum and Bailey Circus for two summers and got to travel with them. Interestingly enough, fast forward maybe 30, 35 years later, um, come to find out in, in my capacity here as a council member that the person who hired me back in, geez, it had to be 1977, bought Circus Vargas. Turns out he had a daughter and um, uh, his daughter had a son. His son was autistic and uh, we have that in common because I have an autistic son as well. Uh, many of you know that this council was the moving force in starting the Regional Autism Task Force and um, Circus Vargas has been kind enough to donate, and I'm, I, I think it's 200 tickets, but I'm, I'm not certain uh, the exact amount. It's somewhere in that neighborhood. They literally just give it away to the special needs community because a lot of the um, special needs community, because it's very expensive to raise a special needs child, um, just typically can't afford to bring the family to a circus. So they come to our town, they'll be here, uh, Geez, I think they're going to be here through uh, the 19th of March. Um, but on opening night, they give away hundreds of tickets so people can enjoy the circus. So um, what you can do for us is, number one, go see the circus. They're a good company. It's a great show. And they come to the community and give back. So we want to welcome Circus Vargas, and we'll talk about that a little more as we get closer. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Ms. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I received a call from uh, a friend, D.I.V., yesterday, who's a fellow Rotarian and a longtime resident of Temecula, <clears throat> who now lives out of state. But she wanted me to be aware, and I want to share with you that uh, a friend of the city in, uh, of Temecula passed away this week, and it was Ruth Cheshire. So she was um, a longtime city employee when the city first incorporated, and she was very, very involved with the Chamber of Commerce. and. Um, I think she also helped with incorporation, and so if we could, in, in her honor, I'd like to adjourn in memory of Ruth Cheshire this evening. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Mike. Um, Ms. Edwards, didn't Ms. Cheshire, and I may be getting them confused, but didn't she play a big part in the theater arts as well? Seems no. to me, it wasn't, maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. Wasn't her, Jeff? Oh, I don't think so, but she mm -mm. definitely played a role in the incorporation committee, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, she was quite a lady. Yeah. And community yeah. services, too. Yeah. She helped with mm -hmm. all the parades and, you know, except and worked with the nonprofits, and she was wonderful, wonderful ambassador for the city. Yeah, thank you. All right, anyone else? No, just a couple um, items on, on my end. Uh, one of those was we had... Uh, Last week, uh, Congressman Calvert joined us here at the city, sort of give an update on, on some of the issues that are happening on the federal side. Um, and then we got to have a conversation about things that were important to the city, including uh, dealing with our transportation issues and transportation funding, and then advocating for the funding and the completion of projects at Murrieta Creek, um, as well as uh, you know, a few other issues here and there. Uh, it was a great conversation. Always important to keep tabs with our uh, 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 folks in the uh, in the Congress. So appreciate him coming out here and, and, and speaking with the city. Um, the uh, last Friday, I attended the first of uh, what they're calling the Mayor's Roundtable. And it's just the uh, five southwestern cities. And we get together for coffee on Fridays, typically now. Uh, about once every few weeks, um, just to talk and make sure we're coordinated together. I think it's important. It's, I know we have a lot of venues for dialogue, but appreciate uh, Mayor Ingram um, pulling that together, and it's a nice informal sort of atmosphere and opportunity for us to chat and, and share some thoughts on, uh, on our, our cities and how we can work uh, better together. Uh, Friday also, and I'm sure somebody's going to mention something. This is probably Mr. Schwank. Am I, am I stepping on your toes on this one? 
No. Uh, I had the, uh, the opportunity to uh, see the uh, Freedom Riders in, in concert at uh, uh, the Temecula Theater. It was a real stirring uh, uh, event. Um, you know, for those of you who weren't able to attend, uh, you, you really missed something amazing. Uh, and I, I wish them all the luck as they, as they move forward and hopefully find uh, uh, other venues to uh, be able to provide such an amazing uh, experience. And I'm sure somebody will maybe fill us in a little bit. I know Zach was there and, and Kevin and many others, and it was great to see all the folks uh, out and supporting such a, such a wonderful uh, event. Uh, that said, we are now on to the consent calendar. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one roll call vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless members of the city council request specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Item number one, waive reading of standard ordinances and resolution. Number two, approve the action minutes of February 13th, 2018. Number three, approve list of demands. <clears throat> Four, approve city treasurer's report as of December 31, 2017. Five, adopt ordinance 18-05, amending section 10.44.010 of the Temecula Municipal Code relating to the use of golf carts on Royal, Royal, Burke, Royal Burkdale Drive from Meadows Parkway to Temecu Drive, second reading. Number six, approve sponsorship agreement with Reality Rally. Inc. for the 2018 Reality Rally fundraiser event for Michelle's Place at the request of Economic Development Committee Edwards and Comachero. Number seven, approve sponsorship agreement with Temecula Education Foundation for the 2018 Taste of Temecula Valley at the request of Economic Development Committee Edwards and Comachero. Eight, approved First Amendment to the exclusive negotiating agreement with Stephen A. Bieri Company Inc for the potential disposition of city-owned property located at the northwest corner of Diaz Road and Dendy Parkway, APN 909-370-049 and 909-370-050. And finally, number nine, approve First Amendment to the agreement with uh, Terry Witcher, DBA, Witcher Electric for maintenance services. Move and consent, Calendar. Second. All second. right, motion on the second. Please cast your votes. And that passes four to zero. And I'm going to adjourn the meeting to Mr. Comachero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to call this meeting of the Temecula Community Services District to order. Madam Clerk, we are all here this evening. Are there any public comments? Thank you. We'll dispense with that then and go to one item on the consent calendar. Item 10, approve the action minutes of February 13, 2018. Move approval. Second. We do have a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. That motion does carry unanimously 5-0. We're now going to have the city council join us in a joint meeting with the community services district. Now, especially for you uh, high school kids out there, um, might seem like there should be 10 of us up here, but there's still only five. Uh, the city council wears several different hats. And uh, we're the city council. We're also the board of the community services district. And so we're having a joint meeting now for a particular item of those two bodies, although we wear the same hats, so it's kind of a technicality. But in any event, this is now a joint meeting to consider item 11, approved fiscal year 2017-18 mid-year budget adjustments, and we'll need a staff report. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Tonight I will briefly summarize the city's mid-year budget request and recommendations. In accordance with the budget and fiscal policies, the city conducts a comprehensive review of its annual operating budget in January of each year. During this review, each department reviews their operating budget to determine if current resources are adequate to meet their operational needs for the remainder of the fiscal year. From this review, a number of recommended amendments to the budget are being presented tonight for council consideration. The first recommendation is to establish a pension rate stabilization program to address the rising cost of CalPERS pension rates. 
This program is outlined in an amendment to the budget and fiscal policies. Secondly, a recommendation to convert 11 project positions to full-time benefited positions will be presented. And after a thorough review of all funds, a number of budgetary amendments will be discussed. And finally, a request to accelerate funding for a capital improvement project is also included in this mid-year budget update. In December of 2016, the CalPERS <coughs> Board voted to reduce the assumed rate of return on the state pension fund in order to improve the financial health of the fund. Over a three-year period, the assumed rate of return on investments will decline from 7.5% per year down to 7%. To make up this shortfall in investment earnings, employers will be required to contribute more funding into the pension fund through higher employer rates. To analyze the impact of this CalPERS decision, staff consulted with an, with an independent actuary, John Bartell from Bartell Associates, to conduct an analysis and provide recommend recommended strategies to address the rising pension costs. <coughs> Mr. Bartell modeled a 30-year outlook for the city's pension and determined that the reduction in the assumed rate of return will cause the city's annual payment to more than double over the next decade. As illustrated on the chart, the city's current contribution rate is equal to 26% of total payroll, or about $3.7 million a year. By 2029, that rate jumps to 39% of payroll, with an annual required payment of approximately $7.7 .7 million. Mr. Bartell recommended several strategies to help mitigate the rising pension costs. The most favored option is to establish an Internal Revenue Code Section 115 Irrevocable Pension Trust. The trust is administered by a third party, and the investments would be professionally managed, with the city retaining oversight of the investment manager and the portfolio's risk level. The funds within the trust are fully protected and are restricted for the payment of pension obligations only. The primary benefit of the trust is the ability to earn higher interest rates than the city would otherwise be able to due to the government code's restrictions on city's investment options. To maximize investment earnings in the trust, staff recommends establishing, this, establishing the trust this fiscal year with an initial $8 million in seed funding to be appropriated from the general fund, which cur currently has $16.9 million in unassigned fund balance. Half of the $8 million would come from the one-time payment received from the state's end of their triple flip financing mechanism and the other half from accumulated savings that have occurred due to vacant positions over the past few years. The Pension Rate stabiliza Stabilization Program is outlined in a new budget and fiscal policy and includes the mechanism by which the trust would be funded and utilized in the future. It's recommended that beginning in fiscal year 2018-19 and beyond, the trust be funded through annual contributions equal to 26% of the city's payroll, which is equal to the current CalPERS rate. And this amount would be budgeted annually through the AOB process and transferred to the trust in the beginning of the fiscal year to maximize interest earnings throughout the year. Additionally, at the end of each fiscal year, the council could divert 30% of any budgetary surplus to the trust, not to exceed $2 million per year. And then finally, at the council's discretion, additional funds may be contributed at any time in the future. These contributions <coughs> would then earn interest and become available for pension obligation payments. Using the current CalPERS assumptions, the trust would likely be active for just over two decades. With the recommended funding strategy outlined in the new budget policy, this chart illustrates the effectiveness of the trust over the next 21 years. The green bars in the chart indicate the amount of funds drawn from the trust each year to augment the city's budgeted 26% rate, which is shown in the blue bars, to make the full payment to CalPERS. Over the next 21 years, approximately 25% of the total pension obligation would be paid from trust proceeds. Staff recommends utilizing public agency retirement services, known as PARS, to administer the trust. PARS is one of only two independent retirement plan administrators in California authorized by the IRS to offer a Section 115 trust, and they have contracted with over 100 public agencies to date to establish their pension trusts. PARS partners with Highmark Capital Management to oversee the trust portfolio and manage the investments of the trust assets. 
Highmark Capital provides agencies investment flexibility by offering five different portfolios, each with a different risk and return strategy. Their 10-year average annual return for the five different options range from 4.3% per year up to 5% per year. Mm. By contrast, the city's rate of return over this period averages below 1% due to the limited mm -hmm. type of investments available to the city. With council's approval tonight, staff will bring back the required legal documents at a subsequent meeting to establish the pension trust with PARS. And we also have Rachel Sanders from PARS in the audience tonight if there are any questions after the presentation regarding PARS or the trust itself. The next mid-year recommendation is to convert 11 TCSD positions from part-time project status to full-time benefited positions. Currently, TCSD employs 144 active project employees. Many of these employees hold seasonal positions such as lifeguards or day camp counselors. However, TCSD has also utilized project employees to perform year-round core operational functions, which would typically be filled with full-time positions. To alleviate operational challenges of retaining project employees, staff is recommending the conversion of 11 positions to full-time benefited positions. The positions to be converted span multiple divisions within TCSD and include the list noted here. The annual fiscal impact of converting these 11 positions to full-time would be approximately $273 per year with the fiscal year 1718 impact estimated at 68,000 for the remainder of this fiscal year. The 11 position conversions are reflected on the revised schedule of authorized positions included in tonight's agenda packet. The mid-year review of general fund revenue resulted in a recommended increase in transient occupancy tax, transfers in, and other revenues, <coughs> while reductions are recommended in franchise fees, licenses and permits, and reimbursements due to less than anticipated revenue received to date. The net impact of the recommended changes is a $4,000 reduction in total revenue. At this time, because only three months of sales tax data has been received, staff is not recommending a change to the sales tax projection. After the next quarter's data is received in late March, we will revisit the projected sales tax for the year and bring back to council in the April timeframe if an amendment is recommended at that time. General fund operating expenditure request resulted in a net decrease of $29,000. While some departments are requesting increases due primarily to higher legal and consulting expenditures, other departments are requesting reductions in their operating budgets due to changing conditions. The Building and Safety Department had originally requested temporary help to assist with developer reimbursed inspections. However, this arrangement did not materialize. So the $352,000 decline in the operating budget is offset by a like reduction in developer reimbursement revenue. And while the Police Department has incurred significant salary savings to date from vacant positions, it is recommended to revisit any budget adjustments for police until after the fiscal year 1718 contract rate has been received from the county in March. Operating transfers in includes the recommended $8 million in seed funding for the pension trust, as discussed earlier. And this amount is partially being offset by a $540,000 reduction in financing costs related to the acquisition of street lights from uh, Southern Cal Edison which would not begin until next fiscal year if the Public Utility Commission approves the acquisition. This slide summarizes the fiscal position of the general fund and illustrates that both the reserve for economic uncertainty and the secondary reserve are both fully funded at $18.6 million or 25% of expenditures. An additional $2 million is earmarked for future capital projects and other commitments leaving an available fund balance of $5.1 million at the end of fiscal year 1718. The city has 12 special revenue funds which are legally restricted and required to be accounted for in separate and distinct funds. Fund 102, or the Road Maintenance Rehabilitation Account, is being added at mid-year in accordance with Senate Bill 1. This budget was originally included in the gas tax fund. Other adjustments reflect recent trends in revenue and are summarized in the table shown here. 
The city has seven internal service funds, which are used to account for services provided internally between city departments. The mid-year adjustments noted in the table include a $175,000 increase to the insurance fund due to higher than anticipated legal claims and expenses, a $100,000 reduction to the information technology fund due to the deferral of the network security audit project to next fiscal year, a $4,000 increase in the technology replacement fund, which reflects the net impact of replacing patron computers at the Ronald H. Robert Roberts Temecula Public Library, and a $2,600 request in the support services fund reflects the annual replacement cost of a new copy machine. TCSD mid-year adjustments include the conversions of the 11 project positions, as discussed earlier, and additionally, TCSD's citywide operations adjustments reflect the transfer of encampment cleanup costs, which were previously included in the public works budget. The library fund includes a $44,000 revenue adjustment to reflect a transfer in from the Measure S fund to fund the annual replacement costs of the new patron computers at the library. And finally, the public art fund request of $30,000 reflects or relates to the Founder Square project and is a carryover from the prior fiscal year. The capital improvement program is requested to be amended slightly to accelerate the funding for the Emergency Operations Center Improvements Project and move $28,000 from fiscal year 1819 into fiscal year 1718 in order to begin the project earlier than originally anticipated. No additional funds are being requested at this time. And that concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, before I do, I do want to recognize our fiscal services manager, Rudy Graciano, and our budget manager, Trisha Hawk, who are both in the audience tonight and worked extensively on the mid-year budget update, and just wanted to give them a shout out as well. Thank you, so Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, any questions from, that was like a uh, 101 in city finance, <laughs> that's good. Uh, any questions from either the uh, board of TCSD or the city council? Yeah, Stu. question about the new positions that are gonna be added. So 11, so what does that do to our PERS uh, long term? I mean, what, what kind of impact is that gonna make? Um, for the most part, these employees have been with us for longer than a thousand hours, which is the, the transition mark to be on PERS, so they're currently already on PERS. Okay, all right. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah um, Mike? if I may. Yeah. Um, are they on, it's a good question and I'll piggyback onto that. Um, are, are they on, we, we changed the, the, the structure of PERS a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are they on the, the, this second tier? Uh, I, we're, we're, let's define the second tier. We, 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 we limited uh, benefits. Uh, I think we changed it to, um, we went from 2.5 at 55 to, help me out here. Yeah, to, um, previous, 2 .7, prior, to, 2 prior to 2011, Employees, if they were hired prior to the 2011, it's 2.7 at 55. If they were hired between 2011 and 2013, they're at the 2% at, at 60. And then if they're hired after January 1 of 2013, they fall under the new PEPRA law, which puts them at 2% 2, two at 62. So, so the majority of these folks are in, in the PEPRA um, range so hired after 2013 but those there are some that are longer tenured and they we have a few of both that are on both tier one and tier two and based on what you told us about CalPERS and, and, and I and I agree with, with what staff wants to do but based on what you told us about CalPERS and the return and setting money aside have we accommodated for mm -hmm. these add-ons to do that in other words have we made are they included in your calculation? Yes. Into the trust? Yes. They're currently in our, in our PERS base as it is, so yes. Okay. And then my next and last question is, um, uh, in your, uh, I suspect you might get into this when we, when we deal with the general fund budget. I was going to ask you about Measure S. Are you going to talk about Measure S when we get to the general fund budget? Absolutely. Then I'll wait till then. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Mm. Okay. Seeing none, do we have any uh, public comment? We do not. Okay, then uh, let's get into some discussion. Anybody have anything to say or do or uh, make a motion or whatever? 
You know, Mr. Kermature, I'll move the item and then add a comment. Um, I'll second for and then for discussion. Uh, you, you know, it's uh, it's a it's a tough dilemma. On one hand, we're we're you know, you just give us a report um, of the crisis that we're in, not necessarily us, but that CalPERS is in, and we're more able to cope with it than most cities, and so we'll be fine. Um, at the on the other end of the coin is is it's absolutely imperative we we keep good employees and so we've spent a lot of time and a lot of energy in training people who know our system know how we operate know our culture in fact and know how we operate and do things and we don't want to lose those to other cities so it's almost like uh, you balance it out and you make the best decision and that's why i could support this thank you mr Nagar. Ms. edwards yeah we are we are making adjustments and planning for the long term and so um, as responsible cities should do, uh, Temecula will, will be all right. And we've been all right in the past, and thanks to our residents, we'll be all right in the future. And this is just some of the, uh, some of the changes that we need to make in order to be able to retain and keep good employees and to be able to balance our budget and then provide for those retirees. And we have uh, adopted, as we said, a multiple tier system for pensions. Uh, a lot of cities haven't done that, and they find themselves in dire straits. So we are making those adjustments so that Temecula will be uh, fiscally stable, fiscally stable long into the future. And I think it's, uh, it's great. And the congratulations. Congratulations, staff. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. You know, I, to echo uh, similar thoughts, I think we, we're seeing a demonstration tonight of why Temecula is Temecula. Mm -hmm. And um, if you go up and down the state, I'm sure you will find a great many cities and counties who are looking at what they're facing, same thing we're facing in terms of increased pension costs and going, oh my gosh, how are we gonna live with this? And yet here we are on the front end of it, getting ahead of it, and it may take 20 years, but when 20 years is up, the issue goes away. And in the meantime, we can deal with it for 20 years. We have the wherewithal to do that. So I, I think it's a, an innovative program. I think it's a, a, a very wise program. Uh, Jennifer, my compliments to you and your team and to Aaron and Greg and everybody that got their heads together uh, to come up with this uh, plan because it's, uh, it's really going to save us a lot of heartache. So uh, well done and it's uh, very easy to support. So with that, let's cast our votes. Uh, Mr. Comichero? Yes. Uh, just a point of clarification for Council Member Nagar. Um, this is a joint meeting, so this presentation covers both the general fund and the TCSD fund. There won't be a, a separate budget presentation. Before we uh, looking at the agenda, looking for that, and and I didn't see it. May I? <laughs> yeah. Inquire? Before we announce uh, the vote, uh, or make the vote. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, just a quick question: um, uh, How is Measure S performing? Is it leading up to expectations? Is it over? Is it under? Just give us a quickie um, so we know. I apologize. I thought you were talking about the budget process that we're. No, that's okay. That's we'll talk about. Sure. Um, Measure S, uh, to date we've received two quarters worth of revenue from Measure S. Um, one quarter was booked to last fiscal year. The first quarter of this fiscal year was booked. It is exceeding expectations. Um, the first two quarters we thought we would bring in about 5.8 million um, and we brought in north of 6 million for each quarter. Uh, we get that information. The next quarter's worth of information we'll get in March. Um, so it is, there is a long lag time between getting the, the actual cash and getting the information. So we'll be reporting on that. When we bring back our sales tax um, recommendation in the March-April time frame, we can report more on Measure S at that time too. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, somebody to punch in a second. There we go. Please cast your votes. Uh, now there are, I think, three uh, resolutions here, so uh, we're voting on all three. Yes. That's the motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that does carry unanimously. So we will now adjourn the joint meeting and uh, go back to the TCSD meeting to finish that up. And do we have a director's, re uh, rather a, uh, yeah. You hey, Kevin, got a report? <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually have one thing, but, but I just wanted to say thank you, board and council, for your support of the TCSD conversions. We sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you. Um, and just one other thing, um, if a picture is worth a thousand words, here's a mouthful. That concludes my it. report. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, then I'll say it. The Rod Run is uh, this weekend, so take advantage of it. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, Mr. Butler, you have anything to add? Nothing tonight, sir. I, I might add uh, that uh, Mr. Adams, our city manager, who is um, not here tonight, he's not here because he accompanied his daughter who played in, was it the CAF final? Semi-final semi semi -final in uh, soccer, and she plays for Temecula Valley High School, and they won. And so he's out uh, with her and doing it as a family, and uh, that's great. So, Go Bears. So we'll, we'll look forward to seeing what happens in the final. So, okay, uh, with that, uh, we'll seek adjournment. Move adjournment. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any objection? Nope. Seeing none, we'll stand adjourned. All right, so I'm going to reconvene meeting Spencula City Council. Let's see, we are moving on to our public hearings. Uh, we have two public hearings tonight. Uh, first one is approval of Old Town Square Marketplace Project. Can we have a staff report? Good evening. Thank you. PA 170324 is a development plan to allow for the construction of a commercial center consisting of two three-story buildings. The project is generally located in the red boxed areas you see before you on Mercedes Street on both sides of Town Square Park. Each building will total 43,640 square feet. The uses within the building will be a mixture of retail and restaurant type uses. The project has been designed per the Old Town specific plan to provide active street frontages. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And also per the specific plan, no parking is required. We should also note that there is a condition of approval on the project that is requiring the applicant to record a parcel merger before the issuance of any of his building permits. If we have a site plan of the project, uh, you can see the north building and the south building. I've also labeled the streets and the location of the Civic Center. And I can use this site plan to show you how a pedestrian will interact with the, the, with the, with the project. Uh, both buildings are essentially mirror copies of each other, so what works with the south building works with the north building. So if I was a pedestrian coming from Mercedes Street, I could enter the structure here under a colonnade. There are entrances to the building through here. I would continue on through the colonnade, coming on to the uh, Main Street side. Again, additional entrances. And as you're all aware, there's a large grade difference between Mercedes Street and Old Town Front Street. So the building had to accommodate that. So we have a small staircase right here where pedestrians would go down and that will take them to the main courtyard. Now this main courtyard also has the main entrances to the structure. If they continue on west, they come to a secondary courtyard. And this courtyard can be used for outdoor dining, special events, things of that nature. As they continue on from the project, they'll come to the public restrooms. And as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, the North Building would function the exact same way. Now, if you recall, the Truax Hotel and its corresponding parking garage were also recently approved. And that project is designed to tie in with the marketplace from a pedestrian perspective. And the way that works is as follows. If I was a guest of the Truax Hotel or if I'm on Third Street, I can cross Third Street, take a pathway through the parking garage across the alley, and I would enter through the rear of the south building and could enter the, the property that way. There's no need to go up over through Mercedes or down through Old Town Front to come up into, uh, into Marketplace from the hotel or from Third Street. Architecturally, the applicant has chosen to go with the Mission Revival style. This is one of the styles pointed out in the specific plan as appropriate. Uh, some of the elements that are indicative of the style that you'll see in the project are clay tile roofs, wrought iron detailing, wood trellises, recessed openings, things of that nature. Uh, we'll take a look at some of these elevations now. This is the north building. We have the view from Main Street and from the rear, Mercedes, and a view from the west. Here we have the south building, again uh, from Main Street, from the rear, and from Mercedes. There are a few other views for you as well. Uh, this would be the view from the Civic Center. Here's a view of the south building from Main Street. This is the rear of both structures, or the same. And this is a view of the south building from Mercedes Street. 
So here is a copy of the landscaping plan. Uh, you can see along the ground floor here, they have the street trees that are required per the Old Town specific plan. There's also a few potted plants and different vines, things of that nature to kind of dress it up. The project was reviewed by both a planning commission subcommittee and a city council subcommittee. Afterwards, the project was taken to the Old Town Local Review Board. Uh, that board recommended approval of the project. And then more recently, the staff was, uh, excuse me, the project was presented to the Planning Commission. Uh, at the public hearing for the Planning Commission, there were five public speakers in support of the project. Nobody spoke out against the project. Uh, the commission unanimously recommended approval. Uh, there was one commissioner absent. Environmentally, staff believes the project is exempt per CEQA section 15162, subsequent EARs and negative declaration. Uh, the reason for this is because the project is consistent with the Old Town Specific Plan, which means it's consistent with the EIR that was created for the Old Town Specific Plan. Based on the information I've just presented, staff recommends the City Council adopt the proposed resolution, conditions of approval, and approve the project. This concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions. We have the applicant's team here as well if you'd like to speak with them. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Do we have any questions, Mr. Nagar? Just, uh, just real quick, um, and I could make it in the form of a comment, but then I'd have to wait till the end, but I think it's important. Um, Eric, uh, the subcommittee consisted of Councilmember Comichero and, and myself. Um, just a quick estimate, how long have we been working on that? I think it's important that the, you know, that the public know and also our council colleagues. Yeah, this, this project came in as a 2017 project. It came in around, I believe, March of last year. Um, <clears throat> and then the hotel before that, that was a 2016 project. So we've been dealing with both these projects for some time. There's been a lot of back and forth with the applicant uh, and staff to get the project to where it is today. Mm. So it's, it's, it's been a, it's, 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 they, they've worked well with us. Um, it's, it's been a, a long road to get here, but we're here and we believe we have a, a quality project. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have a presentation by, thank you so much. Uh, do we have a applicant presentation? Mr. Truax, knowing that you're always here to provide us with a rather tenebrious discussion. Let's see how it goes. What do you have uh, for us? <laughs> good evening. It's good to be here again and have another great project ready for going. And uh, my name is Bernie Truex, CEO of Truex Development. And I have our architect with us, Joe Kalasic. He did both the hotel and this project. And I want to thank staff. We did spend a lot of time working out the details to get both these projects right and to be able to really have a positive impact. And staff was absolutely wonderful to work with and the subcommittees were both a very big help and we're very proud of the part we play in downtown and Old Town. We have a little flyover video as if it were real. Inspired by the open markets of days gone by, the Marketplace, a city center destination, will be a place to gather, taste, experience, linger, and enjoy. Artisans, craftsmen, and specialty shops will fill the open air market, showcasing the best of Temecula. Restaurants, bakeries, and confectionery artists will provide dining experiences too good to soon forget. Tasting rooms featuring local wineries and craft breweries will provide a sample of Temecula that will encourage residents and visitors alike to explore our award-winning and noted wine region and craft beers. The marketplace is designed as a re-envisioned American classic gathering place, one filled with vibrant energy, friendly faces, and a taste of everything Temecula has to offer. Rooftop terraces and open patios will provide hillside vistas as well as spectator seating for community concerts, ice skating, and other Old Town celebrations. Once completed, the marketplace will truly be the heart of Old Town Temecula.
questions? Any, any questions? Or folks? Mr. Truax, thank you, thank you so much thank for uh, the presentation. Great video. Really helps us uh, grab on to what that looks, gonna look, looks like in the future. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, let's see. Now I guess we'll open it up for a public hearing. Uh, Madam City Clerk, do we have any public comments on this item? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we only have one public comment. Ms. Miller. Wow. Okay, Ms. Miller. Eight o'clock, they leave at eight o'clock. Temecula doesn't need more buildings decreasing the sunlight that graced this country town. Instead, another three story building, two of them, is coming in, striking a resemblance of a mini New York, satisfying the whims of displaced New Yorkians. Go back. If such builders don't like the historic buildings and architecture of Temecula, then take a seat in the coal of the East Coast that you have caused by building hot sheets of concrete with concentrations of stalled traffic in the West that goes over and dumps the snow all over because it couldn't do it here in the westerly prevailing winds. No traffic study will ever tell you the pain of sitting wasting expensive gas on I-15 while developers plot and draft more housing and commercial to an overbuilt city. The buildings could house more restaurants, which is outrageous competition for the restaurants that exist. Do you like putting your friends out of business? What is this building for displacing, displacing any of the people that have lived here for years and maybe not in the lifestyles of the rich and famous transplants who have moved here in the last 20 years? This non-town square marketplace, non-marketplace, because it's about office spaces and not about organic farming and not about anything to do with the local fresh fruits and vegetables and grapes except more alcohol and more high-end bars, we won't be able to see the city hall after all we have spent the $66 million of developers' money, and now they've come collecting. So people will become interested in government to prevent any more colossal expense when so many other actions needed to be taken. This seems quite unsafe, an event of earth shaking the old town to rubble with another 87,000 square foot building going to the ground. Topeka, Temecula needs more trees, not more bars and restaurants. Leave those spaces as public outdoor spaces and, not an, and put an outline of trees. This will probably cause the great drop and shaking event, skating event and chalk art festival to go out for a couple of years while they build these things. That was public events that bonded the community. There is no stock market or worries over economy or concerns about creating local jobs. If everything is rattled to the ground during a seismic event, what is this about basements? There are laws that state that California doesn't allow digging below the ground due to seismic concerns. So you're going to tear up Temecula and traffic with construction trucks at the same time the Hara Hotel is being constructed? You are going to run out of town when people figure this one out. You're going to be run out of town. This project will have to have major drain pipes leading to Marietta Creek further bear bearing runoff from cars, lawn, and concrete. Let's hear about those drain pipes. When are they going to be installed? How much of the old town tourism are you going to have to tear up till it's completed? This plan hasn't been before the public long enough. All the other plans have been for years. And you've only been here since last year? This project does not help public safety and general welfare if it is increasing pollution, downsizing water quality from runoff into Marietta Creek. Does this reflect the commercial overlay of the Old Town Plan? It simply competes another space out of business because it is unneeded. That is an historic open space. Why isn't the historical society protecting it? More noise for Temecula. This will add more combustion engine noise. More people sitting on Front Street in their cars. You're glorifying freaking antique cars that are doing nothing but robbing us of the underground safety because they pull out more gasoline. 
where is space, where is the space for all this debris that these buildings will make? What recycling programs is this building going to have? San Diego is sl slowly achieving zero race waste. Temecula hasn't achieved that in apartments, houses, commercial, or any place that is full dumpsters twice a week. And apartments and shopping centers have removed the give to charity boxes for reused items. Where will the tenants acquire water for such a massive project? Miller, like I said, uh, you are up, dreaming please. if you think you are having enough water such, for such huge buildings on such tiny land spaces. I see nothing at all. Materials are of recycled or repurposed. And your time is up. Policemen, come and get me. I am outraged that they're going to do this again. Look at these people. They know nothing about the quality and history of Temecula. We're going to take a brief uh, break here, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and reconvene our, our meeting this evening. <laughs> um, I understand that's our last comment for public. Uh, we have any comments from City Council? Mr. Nagar, I see you in the queue. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. That's fine. You know, um, maybe we can uh, uh, task our uh, people who run Temecula Museum to maybe um, set up a little display out here or maybe in the museum of the 1988 Kaiser Marston report. Um, and, and it was that significant, that Kaiser Marston report, because back in 1988, we decided um, that um, Temecula Old Town literally was a ghost town. Mm -hmm. um, literally tumbleweeds going through town. Um, it closed up shop just about every day at 3 p.m., sometimes earlier on the weekends with very, very little bit of traffic. Maybe you had a couple of restaurants open, and we went ahead and we hired Kaiser Marston. We said, "How do we how do we develop a vibrant old town?" And they gave us a blueprint. And if you pull that document today, <laughs> and you opened it up, you'll see that we followed it point we by point anything. by point by point. And it, it is almost bare some sort of display. And I'm not I'm not being facetious to show exactly where they recommended X. We put X into play. And it took us since 1988. And I won't belabor all the things that we did. But in many ways, many ways, this is almost the conclusion of that plan. I think we're going to update the plan, and I think it's going to ever be evolving. But in many ways, um, this is a conclusion of that plan. Um, I think Mr. Truex has done a fantastic, phenomenal job in designing this project not only for it to accommodate the many eateries that it's going to accommodate, but also designing it in such a way where it takes advantage of um, seating for concert space. Um, I think it's going to launch our old town into a whole nother dimension along with the hotel that you're building, Mr. Truax. And before this evening's over, maybe you could just answer the question of when you plan on breaking ground. My last comment is... Um, you know, I asked Eric when we started this, and Eric gave the right answer. He said the application came in in 2017, because that's when the application did come in. The reality of it is, we were negotiating with Mr. Truax for about a year and a half prior to the formal application coming in. And, you know, it's funny, those discussions weren't always congenial, but they were always respectful. And here we are, winding up in a place today where um, I feel I can fully endorse this, this project. And not only that, uh, Mr. Truex, you made many concessions that are going to benefit the city. And I want to thank you um, for that and for being agreeable to do that. Um, two of which are, number, number one, providing restrooms for our outdoor events, okay, which are very important. When we're holding concerts out there, we always have to rent the porta-potties. Now there's going to be permanent bathroom facilities here, which are badly needed. And then also, too, something that goes unnoticed, um, but 
but uh, we're going to be able to handle this. We always would have to bring in the generators to provide the electricity. Nice. Now we're going to have a dedicated electrical uh, station in which all of our special events can tie into. And so, Mr. Truax, you are the epitome of what we expect development to be in Temecula, to come in, do a quality project. Not only that, but benefit the city as well and make us better as a whole. So I commend you. Um, when the time comes, I'll make the motion to approve it, but I want to respect my colleagues and their comments. All right. Thank you so much. Let's see. We have next in our queue, Ms. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wonder if I could indulge um, the developer, Mr. Truax, to answer a couple of questions, and one of them was, um, we're not creating any jobs. Well, I happen to know we're creating many jobs uh, with these projects, both the hotel and the marketplace. And then um, I checked with uh, Director Hawkins, and so all of these city events will proceed as usual. We may change things that are directly around the, the town square, but you know, all Temecula events go on regardless, and they'll be well attended. And when this is finished, it'll just give us an even more beautiful place for the uh, street painting festival to take place. So I know, Bernie, you and I have talked about the number of jobs we anticipate with the hotel and with the project. So I, w I didn't want that to just float out there. We did a, a financial study on just that. And I don't know, do we have the... We did it both job count and financial impact on Old Town. Plus the amount of, of work that's created for the construction industry right. during construction. So, and I'd be very happy to send that report over in case I am remiss trying to remember a lot of numbers, but the preliminary numbers during all construction was over 1,500 jobs that would be created from the construction and an estimated 300 uh, part-time and full-time jobs once the marketplace is operating. And I would be happy to send you those numbers over officially um, from our MBA student who did that study because they also have the numbers uh, for the hotel as well. Yeah, I'd like to, like to have it and we can make it part of the public record if it isn't already. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And so thank you for clarifying. I knew it was a large number. So thank you. Great. Got another one or? No, that's okay. it. <laughs> if you can maybe answer my question on the breaking ground right here. Yeah. That was, I, I wanted to ask Mr. Truax when he planned on breaking ground. Oh. You have to come back to the mic. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. On the hotel, you say? Uh, on the, the hotel and the... Uh, we, oh. We've actually started on, uh, we did the demo and are now negotiating the contract, final contract to build the hotel. And we're debating whether we're going to start the grading as soon as the permits issued, which could be, you know, any time now or if we want to hold that and put it in the major contract to the guy doing the building. And so it's just a timing of that, but it's probably two months from breaking ground and 18 months from being delivered on the hotel. And we're probably six months to eight months to getting the permit on marketplace. And it's only a year in construction. So we think they wind up timing out to be delivered on the one day wow. into the near future. Be a big okay. event downtown. Wow. Mr. Comachero. Mr. Truex, why don't you stay there for a minute because <laughs> I want to talk to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly when we started this, but we went through a process of uh, selecting you as the developer of choice, which is a very normal process. We go through it. Uh, an RFP process and we had several developers who submitted proposals. And I remember uh, thinking that uh, one, looking at your building right here, the Truex building, which is a terrific building, and I know the work you did on Garrett's building long ago. Um, and I also felt that creativity like that doesn't always come easy. And sometimes it means we're gonna have a bit of the contention that Mr. Nagar talked about before, and I, I too feel very strongly that we came through it very nicely. But I remember saying to our senior staff and our planning staff at the time, I said, we as the subcommittee are gonna recommend Bernie Truax. And I guarantee you two things. He's gonna be difficult to work with, <laughs> and he's gonna produce an outstanding result. Yep. And Mr. Truax, you have succeeded on both counts. <laughs> well, <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. As I get older, I try to get less contentious, but it doesn't it, always an, come out. It ain't working, so. It ain't working. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, it's, um, I think we, we all can be proud of what you've presented. We've all played a hand in it, n none more than you and your staff. But um, the end result is really a spectacular project, and uh, we'll all look forward to that day when both projects, when we cut, when you cut that ribbon. Cut the ribbons. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more thing. Um, I understand. Are your plans in plan check now for this? Have you submitted them yet? The DRC being done on uh, on this. Uh, now kicks off the plans. We're actually, we started ahead of time, so we're about halfway through with the CDs, should be completed with them here in a month or two and have them in. Got it. Thank so you. we're trying to catch up uh, some well spent time in planning. Got it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll just uh, add one, one quick comment, and, and that is. Uh, you know, I, I, I know you love the city deeply. I know you've done a good job putting together projects and, and really trying to represent the character and the spirit of, of what Old Town is, is about. Uh, your vision, uh, it, it works well. It, it fits with the architecture. It fits with the style and design and fits with the, the use that we, uh, we all anticipated with that original Kaiser Marston study. And so I think it's, uh, it's an incredible feat to be, you know, here today talking about this project and uh, I know it wasn't uh, necessarily an easy project because we've got three extraordinarily passionate gentlemen uh, in the room together um, you know talking about uh, how, to, how to do the best thing for Temecula but uh, we're able to come up with uh, quite an outstanding uh, feature and looking forward to uh, seeing that thing open up so thank you so mr. mayor if I may sir. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something just a, a tiny bit unusual. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, that uh, we go ahead and make a motion to move uh, item 12.1. But I'm also going to add, I, I really do believe this needs to be under construction as soon as possible. So I'm going to add to this that, um, to my motion, that it's also the will of the city council that the uh, construction drawing plan check be moved expeditiously through the system. Uh, uh, as uh, as expeditiously as reasonable. Second. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor. And that passes five to zero. For the record, Mr. Truax, you are from West Virginia. Is that correct? <laughs> All right. Just wanted to say. All right. Because it was alluded to that he was from New go York. It's a reference. Go back. Um, so, so stay here in Temecula because we love what you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Next item, number two, introduction of an ordinance uh, related to collection containers. Can we have a staff report, please? Thank you, Mayor Ron. Good evening, and good evening, City Council members. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, this item is for a uh, development code amendment that I'll get into in just a second. I wanted to talk a little bit about the issues in which we're, um, we're having or the issues that, that um, uh, uh, regarding development or, um, sorry, collection containers. Um, they do provide a service to the community and um, by facilitating donation of items uh, for resale or redistribution. They do, however, um, become targets of graffiti and uh, illegal dumping, which mm -hmm. have a negative impact on the community. And when they're not properly maintained, they can pose a public health risk. <laughs> We've seen an increase in these in the city. Uh, they're placed in parking lots, typically, or on unimproved lots. <clears throat> and the, because of this, we are recommending a municipal code amendment that will establish regulations for these containers. The code amendment would add a new chapter 
chapter 17.42, collection containers to Title 17 of the Municipal Code. The proposed ordinance would allow collection containers with the issuance of a temporary use permit on commercially zoned properties, whether they are within specific plans or plan development overlays or um, the generally um, uh, commercial zoned properties. And as long as they are in compliance with the proposed development and operational standards. They would be prohibited um, in residential zoning districts, on unimproved lots, in parking lots, in public parks, and open space areas. Um, they are, would also be prohibited if they cause a uh, safety hazard or obstruct the pedestrian flow um, or vehicular flow of traffic or um, placed in any manner that is detrimental to the public health and safety. <clears throat> there are a couple exemptions for or within the ordinance. They, this, the chapter would not apply to recycling containers that are used by the franchise um, hauler, CRNR, or um, it also does not apply to a state certified beverage container recycling center that you would see or typically see at grocery stores in the parking lot where your bottles and cans are taken back for a redemption value. The development standards, um, as I mentioned, it re would require a temporary use permit. It would expire one year from the date of issuance. They must be located within 20 or linear feet of a building entrance and not project more than four feet from the building. There are dimension standards, those are the maximum that are consistent with the manufacturers that are out there that uh, manufacture these containers. And the material um, shall not be made of wood, cardboard, plastic, or any non-metal material. The operational requirements for collection containers, they must be kept free of any structural damage or any defacing such as graffiti or stickers, um, any rust. They must be kept locked and secured at all times, and they must be serviced no less than uh, every seven days. They are required to have information posted on the, um, on the containers that identify the company name, whether they're a for-profit or non-profit, and how to contact them. There's enforcement provisions within the chapter, and that if they're in violation of the code, they may be declared a public nuisance, and uh, we would follow the procedures for public nuisance abatement in Chapter 8.12 of the Municipal Code. There's also a proposed grace period that would um, require the existing containers that are out there to come in compliance with the new regulations. It's a 90-day grace period, um, and the city may then dispose of these containers if they are not brought into compliance. The Planning Commission heard this on February 7th and adopted a resolution recommending the City Council approve the proposed ordinance. They did request that we clarify um, the language as far as defacing the, the containers that it just not apply to graffiti. And they also uh, requested that we remo remove the word junk um, as uh, the description of materials that are found <laughs> around the containers. Um, those two items have been um, uh, addressed in the staff report, I mean, in the ordinance that's attached to the staff report um, in your packet tonight. The recommendation of staff is that you adopt the ordinance that amends 17.04020 for temporary use permits and adding a new chapter 17.42 collection containers to Title 17 of the Municipal Code. And that concludes my staff report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Mr. Stewart. So, do you, have you ever run into a situation where Have you ever run into situations where uh, people have dropped these off in the parking lots that they don't have permission from the property owner? Yes, we have. And yeah. so, do, how does, how is that addressed? Um, code enforcement is typically brought into the situation and they would contact or, or try to find the, the, um, the operator and notify them. Because that's something I didn't see in the permit process is that the landlord or the owner of the property sign off on the ability to drop these because quite often they don't own the property these things are put on. So that's what I would like to see. I would like to see the property owner has to sign off on the permit to, um, 
to gain access to that property? Correct. The, um, the TUP, the temporary use permit, does require property owner signature. Okay. Um, so they, um, in the application process, it does require that. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Mayor, if I could just add one point to that. I, I certainly agree with what Dale has said, but there's also a provision that says the property owner and the operator are jointly liable for complying with all these provisions. So even if for some reason the operator left, the property owner would still need to maintain the bins and to uh, make sure that all conditions were complied with. All the junk was picked up? Yes, as we define it. Right. Okay. Ms. Edwards? I thought it was a little tenebrous that, that I wasn't sure why we were promoting them being placed near the entrances of the establishments or of the, like the local business. I'm sorry, the question is why were they? I know, I used the word tenebrous in, in, in an homage to, to the mayor. <laughs> so, yeah. So we asked, it, it specified that it has to be within 20 feet of the entrance. And the thinking behind that is that, it, like theft or? I, no, the thinking behind that is uh, because we've been encountered break-ins to these um, and the material or the, the, the Okay, the theft and then it's spread, spread everywhere. Yeah. Okay, that's um, what and I And people will drop off stuff even though they're not um, uh, items that are accepted such as uh, appliances and mattresses. Right. Um, this will help main, or ensure that these things don't happen and that they get cleaned up right away. Well, I think it'll also prevent... Uh, you know, the whole permitting process and the fact that it has to be 20 feet from the entrance is going to make the, the property owners think twice, maybe in some cases, about allowing this on their premises. So I think that's good, too. I mean, you know, we have to honor the property owner's wishes and, and uh, for security reasons. Okay, thank you. That was not tenebrous at all. That was very clear. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Nagar. Yeah, just real quickly, because um, Councilmember Edwards... Uh, brings up an interesting point. Um, I, I presume in the TUP process, um, you'll examine how many parking spaces it's going to take and uh, what type of impact that has. If it has to be 20 feet away from the entrance, I'm presuming it's gonna go in the parking lot, which would mean it's gonna take up spaces pretty doggone close to the facility. Yeah, let me, let me clarify that. I wasn't clear in my presentation. It's a 20 linear feet um, from the main entrance of the building. So they would be pushed, uh, they would be placed up against the building themselves. So they wouldn't be in a parking lot or a drive aisle. They would have to be up against the building. Clarify that. So it's t within 20 linear feet of the entrance? Of the main entrance of the building, correct. So it would have to be up against the building. That's correct. And, okay, that, thank you for that clarity. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that would, is going to create a deterrent from, I mean, I, I would I would think that that's going to cause a lot of people or a lot of businesses to not want these and and in which case is there a downside to that uh, I mean they are collecting goods and uh, I know there's a, a there's a lot of money in the resale of these things and a lot of it go well, actually once somebody puts it in there who knows where it goes I'd be honest with you um, mm -hmm. Uh, we know Salvation Army or Goodwill, they have stores, et cetera. Same thing with the Assistance League. Right, but, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, you know, but, but so, so I mean, it, it, I am almost wondering, and I'm not certain where I'd stand on it, to be honest with you, but if it has to be within 20 linear feet, it would seem that not many businesses are going to want that that close to their facility. Right. And maybe that's something we need to talk about. Just, again, I don't even know where I stand on it, but it's something maybe well, we need to talk about. And I have a thought it, uh, along those lines. You know, this may help to promote this type of, uh, you know, um, a depositing spot at some of the, you know, the, the maybe they can work in cooperation with some of the local charities. I don't know, but I think it's a good preventative step to keeping them from just dropping them any place, and then we wind up with trash and things like that and and we know that probably you know, homeless individuals or I mean anybody can have access to that once it's piled up around, around one of those receptacles in a parking lot so you know I would think um, and it, and the fact that the property owners have to sign off uh, I think it is definitely that was the reason for my question I think it is going to make a change and be a deterrent from them just dumping things yeah and so I think that's okay Thank you. Can I uh, 
mind if I ask a quick question? Can you go back to the slide where you were talking about the grace period? Yes. So I, I went through a little fast. Operators shall be charged actual costs of removal. Um, so my, my question was in, in, in sort of this interim period while, while there's a number of these facilities that obviously have to come into compliance and, and so forth, um, and you know, our, our, our latest uh, um, uh, requirements say, you know, you have to have contact information and so forth. Are we aware of any of these facilities that have no contact information or direct link? So, you know, what do we do in the, in, in the case that somebody doesn't want to come into compliance and we have no way of contacting them and we have these boxes out there that are operating, you know, out of, uh, out of ordinance? Yeah. We discussed that earlier, um, and um, that very issue, if we're not able to contact them, we would have to post something on site um, if we we're unable to uh, contact them. So that when they do come to service the boxes, they would get that information. Sure, and is there, uh, I'm thinking maybe from a legal perspective, is there a period of time that we have to have a notice affixed to the the property and a period of time for them to cure and then are we required to hold the item for a certain period of time after that if they don't? Um, yes, if, if they haven't uh, removed the container, uh, the city has a very quick process by which you notify them in any way that you possibly can, um, give them an opportunity to cure and then if they don't, um, the city can um, either find them or uh, get a, a, an abatement warrant to take it away. And again, remember, it's both the property owner and the operator that are responsible and liable for but it. I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the ones that are out there now that don't fall under this. So, you know, there right, might but, be some rogue. After 90 days, the property owner is responsible for removing them. Even if they're, I, I guess, I guess it's sort of a burden because I, I can think of a couple locations where I'm not sure the property owner was necessarily contacted or they're operating under this kind of, you know, authority. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in that instance, what are we doing? Because it's kind of an undue burden to the property owner uh, in some respects to, you know, if somebody's doing something illegal on their property that they may or may not know of, you know, I'm thinking the instance in, uh, uh, I know there was one outside where uh, in and out is, um, you know, and that one was attracting all sorts of, of, you know, issues. It's not clear who's, you know, it's not on anybody's direct property. I'm sure the owner, it seems to be, you know, it's a vacant parcel where it was located and there may not be an agreement. Um, so, we're, you know, in an instance like that, where, you know, where are we, where are we going with something like this? Mr. Mr. Mayor, can I add something to this with regards to law enforcement? Um, one of the issues we have with these is uh, homeless. Many of the homeless will gather around those who also use them as shopping centers, for lack of a better word, which is obviously causing a quality of life problem with the city. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Um, Mayor, if I could just add, um, I understand what you're saying, but just as with any um, code violation on any individual private property owner's property, they would be responsible for, for curing that violation. Um, this, this case would be no different, even, even if it um, uh, was not the act, them, the, the owner themselves acting to, to violate the code, they are still responsible for keeping their property uh, within compliance. Okay. And, and even if it's on property where the property does, owner doesn't have an agreement, doesn't know it's there, the still, city still has access to that person's name and address, and I suspect code enforcement will be looking at all those specific mm -hmm. Uh, containers and notifying the property owner, then in 90 days you're going to be responsible for removing it. All right, fair enough. My, uh, and, and I just wanted to piggyback on what Mr. Nagar said earlier too, and that was the uh, um, the idea of you know the for-profit bin versus the non-profit bin. Um, and you know, look, we have some wonderful non-profit organizations in the community. Um, there are accountability standards, you know, and assessments that are done for nonprofit organizations to see how much of the, you know, how much of the donation or good is going toward, you know, the actual cause itself versus, you know, other things. And they have these sort of metrics on which to measure. Um, my question is more in line with what you were saying earlier, uh, Mike, was, you know, look, if somebody just placards something saying, well, we're a nonprofit and, you know, proceeds are going to go to whatever, where's the accountability? Like, where's the reporting where we would know that, 
you know, what they're saying is actually true because there are going to be some bad actors, and clearly there are some bad actors in this industry that aren't managing their, their you know, property appropriately. And so where's the accountability if we're allowing them to, you know, market themselves as a nonprofit to, you know, actually be able to verify that what they're saying is, is true? Mr. Mayor, um, this ordinance uh, does not consider uh, a nonprofit versus profit. This is, this is really an arrangement between, between a property owner and a vendor to lease space on their property. What this ordinance is really doing is, is, is looking at the regulation of the physical piece of infrastructure on the property, where it's located, how it's maintained, uh, but not necessarily the business relationship between the property owner and the for-profit or nonprofit entity that is in business with the property owner. Comment. Sure. You know, in that regard, when, when people donate to these types of places, it really isn't incumbent upon the city to determine the, the nonprofit status. If people are concerned about putting their used clothing or items there, then it's incumbent upon them to check on the nonprofit status, number one. And a lot of these receptacles are used, and you can see the, the items piled around were clothing and fabric. And so a lot of times um, people will recycle those, and, and what they do is they sell it as fabric by the pound, and it's, it is uh, bleached and all the color removed, and, and fabric is then uh, processed just like you would recycling paper. And they make new things out of it, out of fabric and things like that. And, and then if it is a nonprofit, they can turn you know, the 17 cents a pound that they get for the rags into action in a community. But in this instance, really, it, I don't think it's incumbent upon us to determine the nonprofit status. Uh, they're not coming to the city looking for you know, a CDBG grant or any kind of grant. They're just looking for a permit like any other uh, business owner would. And I think what this does, and you know, I've been on every side of the nonprofit issues like this, I think it gives, um, it actually elevates these receptacles to a level of more legitimacy rather than just being a place where people are going to dump things. And it causes them to have to build a relationship with the legitimate businesses here in town. And there are businesses that do um, support nonprofits through different things. We see receptacles outside of like Walmart for, for canned goods and things like that. So I kind of consider this the same thing. They're providing a venue for people to um, you know, donate or recycle. And I think in that case, businesses are very careful about the nonprofits they support. So I think they're going to do their own policing and they're going to check the legitimacy of this type of thing before they sign off on that permit. And then they're going to hold that company or, you know, nonprofit accountable. And so I think it's a better thing. Um, right now, they're kind of like dumping grounds sometimes. I know there are some legitimate ones, but they're, because of, there's not good regulation, um, you know, it, it's really um, not beneficial to the property owner and who knows about the, the quote-unquote nonprofit. But I think this raises the level of legitimacy and it causes relationships to be built and there's an accountability factor there. So I really actually like this. Uh, we have places, wonderful nonprofits that, that, that have thrift stores and that recycle and, <coughs> you know, they, I think they'll continue to thrive. Um, a lot of times these aren't the kind of things that people <coughs> will, will take to, these are the kind of things that might be left over after your garage sale is over that no one wanted, and so you bag them up and you take it to this place, maybe out of convenience or something. But um, again, I see it as a, a, it's a, it's a way for us to um, raise the level of legitimacy and to provide a level of accountability. I think it's a good thing. Okay, Mr. Nagar. Yeah, a couple of things stimulated by uh, my, my colleagues. So the TUP is for one year, Correct. Correct. And have we put a limit on the number of TUPs? In other words, they, they have to come in a year later and renew it? They have and, to come in a uh, year later and renew it. That's and, correct. And they can continue to do that indefinitely. Correct. So it's not, so in, in a theory, it's not really a temporary, it, it, it is, but it isn't. Uh, it's controllable. It's temporary and that it expires. It's controllable. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's okay. I, I mean, I'm trying not to overthink this. It's interesting, you know, uh, Mr. Mayor, you brought up a couple of things that stimulate some thinking here, is that if, if we were looking at a new project, like we looked at Mr. Truex's project, I don't think there's any chance whatsoever that he's going to allow one of these at, at, at the project he just presented to us. No. But, but 
it, it does beg the question, if it is for profit and they are paying rent, um, how many of these things, when our planning commission and our council are looking at it, would right. we say, yeah, sure, you can approve that storefront, and oh, by the way, yeah, you get approved with your permit, <laughs> you know, uh, three, th three bin locations, you know, that you're going to put there. I don't want to overthink that. Okay, um, because I don't know that we would really like a proliferation of that as part of our architecture throughout the city. But I don't know if that's going to happen yet. But I think we probably need to watch that. The other thing which is more poignant, which you brought up, which I think is more uh, epidemic, and that is um, you got these companies, as soon as their bins removed for whatever reason, even by a private property owner, they just dump another one. And, and so... Um, in, in, yeah. you, you brought up a point of it being an onus on the property or, or a burden on the property owner because sometimes the property owner doesn't even know who these people are. The bin's mm -hmm. not marked. I mean, right out in front of PetSmart, you got right out there, it's terrible. Yes. I've looked because I was going to report it. it it's, um, you might have taken that picture out in front of PetSmart. It looks just like it. There's nobody to call. Um, I don't, we don't know how it, often it's being serviced. And if you went and you talked to the owner, they'd probably say, I don't know. You know, it's put at the far side of the parking lot. Nobody <laughs> parks there anyway. So, you know, whatever. But now we're going to say, Mr. Property Owner, you're responsible for removing it, and we're going to fine you if you don't. I'm okay if you want to give a, a longer grace period un, uh, under those circumstances to, to, to the fine to the property owner. Because he may find himself a victim here. Yes. Um, yeah. But, Mr. Mayor, if... If a person comes and dumps a container bin on a private party's property and there's no name and address on it, it's a piece of trash, and the property owner could remove it. He, he doesn't may. need to. Um, he doesn't need to go through any process to. Uh, you're you're to correct. Remove it. Except removing one of these things is near impossible unless you have the equipment. Oh. I mean, these things they weigh they weigh a good 500 pounds easily. You need a you need a truck with a with a block and tackle lift to, to lift one of these things into the truck. It's, it's, it's not easy, I guess is my point. There would be an expense mm -hmm. in having to remove this by the property right. owner, and mm -hmm. it wouldn't be cheap, but so noted. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, uh, I just one thing too, as Dale mentioned, there's one of the development requirements is there's one container per legal lot. Correct. So there's, it's, mm -hmm. you're not gonna have five or six in front of a, uh, a business at any one time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Comanchero. I think this is uh, not perfect, but we're trying to solve a problem, and I think it does solve the problem we're looking to solve. Uh, hopefully it doesn't create too many other problems. But I, I think on balance from what we've heard, it's better to adopt it than not adopt it in my mind. I, I, so uh, I'm prepared to support it, but I'd like to see a review. It doesn't necessarily have to come back to the council, but, uh, but a review by staff in um, let's say six months after uh, implementation and maybe again at 12 months and let's see if it's working and if it's not we can always bring it back and tweak it so I, with that I'll, I'll make the motion that and we I'll approve. second with a question one question last question or, yes Ms. Edwards S Mr. Nagar brought up the, the length of the permit what happens if we issue the permit and the business owner has signed off on the permit and then he decides three months in, this is really a bad thing. Does he have in the authority to, I mean, he can't renege on his signature on the permit. We've issued the permit, so now, now what do we do? He doesn't want them there anymore. The permit just gives him permission. He can take advantage of the permit uh, or not take advantage of the permit. That's the property owner's discretion. Okay. So they can have, once they get a permit, they can they can place one of these uh, bins on their property in a proper location or not. It's up to them. Okay, so it's not for that particular company. It's just for the property owner to be able to solic or solicit or do RFPs or whatever for any person to come and, and put it's one It's for on that specific business okay. along with the permission of the property owner. But it, if the property owner doesn't permit on their own the business to locate the bin there, then that's their prerogative. Okay. Okay, so that protects the business owner. Can I uh, maybe ask for a friendly amendment to your motion, Mr. Comatero? I like friendly, I say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, 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 I really like, I, I wrote down, a, you know, reporting back uh, requirement too. I think that's a good, good option. Um, but I'd, I'd like to see it, you know, uh, at, at council. I'd like to just, you know, quick, 
quick two minutes to let us know what's happened in the last six months to see what the successes are. And then, you know, if there's any, you know, again, I'm just, uh, I share Mr. Nagar's concern about the, some of the business owners. If there's an undue burden, you know, to folks and they're just, they're struggling with this, either from a logistics standpoint or a cost standpoint, um, you know, let's make sure that we uh, are as, as uh, forgiving as possible in those grace periods and, and uh, enforcement, you know, if a property owner is struggling with this and trying to make right, so. Absolutely. I'm thinking about how friendly I want to be. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I could support that just to stay friendly, but I, I really don't like it. I, I mean, I think if there's no problem, why take up time at a council meeting? So uh, I'll offer an amended amendment. All right. How about if it reports back to the mayor and the mayor can decide whether it needs to come to the council? I like it. Absolutely. Second. Okay. Sounds good. We're good. All right. So I'll amend the, my motion to that re in that regard. And I'll second it, and, and one last comment. I already seconded it. Oh, Mike. did you really? Then I take back my second second. But, but and, and again, I don't want to change anything, but just for a topic of discussion, you know, we, we have nonprofits in town that, that take goods like this. Uh, three I can think of are Goodwill, Salvation Army, and the Assistance League, and there's probably more. Safe. Um, and there's a, um, there's a lot of money in the in the rehabilitation and resale of these goods. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there's part of me that says, should a, a company from outside the area make a deal with somebody and come in and drop off a bin that might otherwise go to a local center that benefits our nonprofits? I don't want to overthink this. I think we just need to watch it, but that's just something I just wanted to mention that just on the overall radar screen. And I'll call for the question. All right. Oh, did, did, was I'll there public to, comments? Uh, I, I don't read know the ordinance. Know. Ordinance title. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, this be an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Temecula amending section 17.04.20020, temporary use permits, and adding a new chapter 17.42, collection containers to Title 17 zoning of the Temecula Municipal Code, and finding the ordinance is exempt pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15061B3. Okay, cast your votes. And that passes five to zero, thank you so much. Uh, next item number 14, uh, related to electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Can we have a staff report please? Yes, Mr. Mayor. This uh, report is regarding a program known as the Local Government Partnership Program, which is a grant funding opportunity to improve air quality in our community. The program is actually offered by a, an agency known as the Mobile Source Air Pollution Reduction Review Committee, or the MSRC. The MSRC was established by the California Legislature in 1990, and its sole mission is to invest in uh, reduction in air, qual air pollution generated by mobile sources or vehicles on the road. The funding that this uh, committee uh, provides to uh, implement these types of reductions is, is uh, allocated through the um, a surcharge on the mo mo uh, motor vehicle registrations or your, your vehicle license fees. The MSRC works closely with the South Coast Air Quality Management District, uh, the AQMD, however, it is not the same agency and it does uh, work on investing in projects that support the goals of the AQMD. So as you probably know, our air basin uh, does have uh, problems. It's, it's uh, got a uh, designation known as an extreme non-attainment zone for ozone. Uh, and so what does that mean? That means we need to find ways to reduce the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. The state has adopted uh, legislation that uh, establishes policies for reducing that amount of ozone. And uh, primarily ozone is generated uh, from NOx pollution, which is the pollution that's emitted from uh, motor vehicles or cars on the road. The uh, goals that have been adopted for the reduction in the amount of NOx in the atmosphere is to reduce that amount by 45% by the year 2023 and by 55% by the year 2030. So how do we reduce, reduce the NOx emissions by 45%? Uh, that is to implement uh, provisions in the AQMD's air quality management plan, which uh, includes a roadmap for uh, cleaning up the air in our basin. 
So the MSRC is partnering with the AQMD and wants to partner with agencies within the zone in order to reduce the amount of emissions. And uh, the strategies that are involved include uh, traditional regulatory measures, which are implemented through the AQMD, and an incentive-based program to accelerate uh, policies and programs to introduce uh, zero emission and near zero emission vehicles, which is what this grant uh, program is intended to do. So this grant program uh, we're uh, planning to apply for uh, will fund a portion of the cost of purchasing electric vehicles, and we're planning to apply to purchase two electric vehicles, which, which would replace uh, vehicles we have in our current fleet. Uh, and uh, the grant would allow for up to $10,000 towards the purchase of each of those vehicles. And it also uh, it allows for the, um, the installation and purchase of electric vehicle charging stations. And we're planning to apply for funds to install eight new charging stations, <coughs> four here at the Civic Center that would go along with the charging stations that we currently have here, and four at our new park and ride facility on Temecula Parkway and the uh, grant program will fund up to 75% of the cost of those EV charging stations. Uh, and also I just want to let you know that this uh, presentation here was actually a mandated part of the application for this grant program. So if you notice the, uh, the, the little uh, logo on the, the presentation, that's, uh, that's the reason for that. So in order to apply for these grant funds, it was required to make this presentation to the council and for the council to adopt a resolution supporting the application. And that concludes the staff report. Thank you. Any questions? Move approval. Second. I think we have to open the public hearing first and see if we have any public comment. We do not have any public comment. All right. Good. So now we can move on to uh, approval. Now I'll make the motion. All right. Thanks, sir. Okay. And I'll make the second now. Right. Randy, did you give me the floor? Okay, that also passes five to zero. Um, let's see, next on the agenda, joint meeting of City Council and Public Traffic Safety Commission. Um, I think we can assume everyone is still here, so we can dispense with the uh, roll call. And Mr. Sullivan, good evening. Good evening. Uh, let me see if I can clear this from the... <coughs> All right, Mayor Ron, council members, distinguished staff, my name is Brad Sullivan and I have the honor of serving as the 2018 chair to the Temecula Public Traffic and Safety Commission. Before starting our presentation, I'd like to introduce you to my fellow commissioners that are present tonight. To my immediate left is our vice chair, Commissioner Skip Carter. Next to him is our newest member, Commissioner Ivan Moses and our longest serving commissioner, Bob Hagel. The Public Traffic Safety Commission is responsible for dealing with a variety of issues that are related to the goals identified in the city core values. Those values are transportation mobility and connectivity, a safe and prepared community, a sustainable city, accountable and responsive city government, and healthy and livable city. The Public Traffic Safety Commission is responsible for dealing with a variety of issues that are related to the goals identified in the city's, I just repeated that, I apologize. The commission achieves the goals, I'm going way ahead here. We did the core values, thank you. The commission achieves the goals identified by addressing the following. Neighborhood calming. The purpose of neighborhood calming is to promote community involvement by proactively addressing traffic calming features such as edge line striping, parking lane striping, medians, bike lanes, chicanes, bulbs outs, as well as residential multi-way stop signs and circles. This slide indicates the locations where traffic calming features have been implemented in the last year. 
This first slide here is uh, the corner of Calle Pina Colada and it demonstrates a time turn restriction off of La Serena and to the right on uh, Pina Col uh, Colada is um, a VCOM uh, traffic calming sign. Um, this is in response to residents' complaints about the volume of traffic on that street as well as the speed of traffic on that street. It was approved by the council as a pilot program and uh, data is being collected and monitored and uh, the Department of Public Works will be meeting uh, with the residents on that street uh, in March to gather updated response from the community as well as provide them with uh, new data that's been uh, demonstrated. Measures will be changed and adjusted to try and achieve the best goal possible for the residents. This next picture shows uh, traffic calming that the uh, city permits for residential areas. And this way we're looking at a picture at an all way stop control, again, to slow down traffic in residential neighborhoods and to prevent um, uh, accidents. The commission plays an important role in considering the implementation of traffic control devices to ensure the safety of Temecula motorists and maintain a family friendly environment. The commission has considered all-way stop signs at the intersection shown with subsequent traffic signal controls at Butterfield Stage Road and La Serena Way. Here you see uh, an interim all-way stop control until an actual signal device can be installed. Here you see traffic signal improvements at Butterfield Stage Road and La Serena Way. As you know, that was the site of a fatal accident and uh, this we believe will correct that. And then also uh, in this final slide, uh, there are uh, two three-way stop signs on Temecu Drive. The Commission takes an active role in reviewing and providing input on the transportation circulation process to ensure the safety of motorists and pedestrians. The Commission also takes an active role in providing input on policy issues to ensure the safety of Temecula motorists and pedestrians. The Commission also interacts with our police department on various programs, such as the Every 15 Minute program. Um, that's an educational program at our high school, and it involves uh, setting up a collision scene from an accident where uh, students were involved driving under the influence. And I've attended one of those. I can tell you it's very emotional. The students get it. They're really kind of shocked afterwards. And I think it makes a lasting impression that hopefully will be in their minds anytime they think of drinking and then driving or partaking in drugs. Uh, obviously, we also work with the DUI checkpoint program. And then we have uh, volunteers that serve on the community action patrol, and that helps the uh, support the police department. We have our NET program, which is the neighborhood enforcement team, the stoplight abuse program, neighborhood watch, crime prevention through environmental design, and coffee with a cup, uh, a cop, no donuts. Temecula Fire Department is also interactive with our commission. Uh, they offer public classes and safety, including CPR, AED, first aid, CERT, HCP, and then public outreach with their fire safety trailer and at uh, safety fairs and expos throughout the community. Shown on this next slide are the topics that are on the horizon for consideration in this coming year. Um, today, the state of California just removed the requirement that there be a backup licensed driver in an autonomous vehicle. That's gonna create all sorts of new and interesting uh, issues to look at and, and to advise, so we'll be looking at that. We're also gonna be looking into uh, providing a pedestrian crossing at Great Oaks High School, uh, Del Rey and Via Norte circulation study, uh, continuing our neighborhood traffic calming program, again, to keep our residential areas safe, school area traffic circulation safety, and public gatherings. 
That concludes my presentation for this evening. I'm happy to take any questions. I got one question. Mr. Stewart, yes. What's that SLAP program? SLAP, that's the stoplight enforcement program. Yeah, what so is that? People that are running through red lights or trying to speed up and get through the light early. So what do they do? Have to take that class? if they? No, no, no. This is a program where the traffic team actually enforces this. And, and sets up at locations where it's been an issue and incites drivers. So these are police officers doing that? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. That's all those that I listed in that area are, are areas that we interact with Temecula Police Department. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Mr. Nagar. Yeah, I think maybe to elaborate a little further, um, our, uh, our past council member, former county supervisor, and now state senator who loves acronyms, okay, um, named it SLAP, Stop Light Abuse Program, and primarily, and, and I bring this up because we continue to get um, complaints, it's an aggressive law enforcement program to write tickets to red light runners. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the whole purpose behind it. Um, so uh, when we get it both ways, if you're watching at home, we get it both ways. We get emails that say we're not writing enough tickets to stop red light runners, and then we get it on the other side saying we're writing too many tickets. It's, yeah. And yeah. So, um, but that's the genesis of that. And and adding to that, it really is an enforcement to prevent the the left turners because we don't get a lot of revenue from writing tickets. A lot of it goes to the courts or to the county or other, and the state. So, um, it's not a revenue generator for us as many would think. It really is to keep them from making those left turns in front of uh, traffic that has the green light. Mr. Mayor, can I add something that, if you don't mind? Yes, sir. I just wanted to reinforce what we talked about with the, uh, the traffic enforcement, especially in the moving violations. A number of years ago, the city of Temecula had, I believe it was 2014 or so, 16 fatal traffic collision, collisions in the city. Typically now we're doing about an average of two, which is still bad, but it's significantly lower since we've really increased enforcement. So mm -hmm. enforcement works, there's no doubt at all. Great. Saves lives. Wonderful. Any other questions? All Thank right. you so much. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. All right. Do we have a public safety report tonight, uh, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. Is it my turn? It is. Awesome. Thank okay. you for joining us. This Thank evening. you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make it quick. I'm just going to throw some numbers at you. So uh, the, uh, the Temecula Police Monthly Report for January of 2018, uh, our deputies responded to a total of uh, 6,851 incidents, and that ranges from traffic accidents to uh, traffic tickets up into including violent assaults. Out of that number, uh, 1,841 were traffic citations, 151 were traffic accidents, 77 were DUI investigations. So our actual calls for service where a member of the public called for law enforcement was about four, uh, 4,700. Um, in addition, we had uh, 57 calls for service for loitering and panhandling, and uh, nine uh, files were pulled for our outreach, uh, homeless outreach program. Um, I also wanted to add the active shooter training. Um, over the last year or so, uh, we have a couple of deputies assigned to, or a couple of officers assigned to the police department that have been going to the local schools doing active shooter training. Um, soon, very soon, we'll be offering it to the public as well. So um, I encourage the public to uh, look onto the uh, city's website for date and times to come. So we're really going to focus on that as well. And that's all I have. All right, wonderful. Look forward to seeing the uh, active shooter training here. It'll be just across the way here from... Uh, City Hall, as my understanding, yes, we'll be rolling those out relatively soon, and I'm sure we'll be doing a pretty pretty aggressive outreach campaign to uh, to our community, our, our parents and students, and and other members to make sure that they uh, they get all the information and training that's that's needed. Without a doubt, appreciate that. Thanks Thank you so you. much. All right, uh, Commission reports, Mr. Sullivan, we're good. I've said enough. All right, Mr. Yeomans. Uh, nothing. Well, just one item. We had a. Um, a cane chicken project off of on uh, Margarita, which we looked at. A lot, of, a lot of input from the neighbors around it opted to continue the, the item until we got more input from all the players. So that will be coming back. But it was a very good meeting in terms that there was a lot of participation. So, All right. Thank you, sir. 
Mr. Schwank. Mr. Mayor, I just would like to sort of piggyback on your comments about Freedom Riders. Uh, our family was uh, lucky enough to attend that concert, and uh, I just uh, sort of the one word to me it was just powerful. It was a truly a beautiful night, um, and I think uh, Director Hawkins and I even had some discussion about it, and just think it's a great conversation to have. Um, it was a great history lesson because you don't really uh, learn about that too much. So it's something that uh, we look forward to continuing uh, in the future. And um, if it'll be on Broadway someday. I, I think it's that good. And then uh, two weeks ago, I brought up Pickleball. Uh, you sent me with some homework to find out uh, uh, the name of it. So I did. Turn, turns Thank out you. I, you know what? I was, I was going to call you out on it if you didn't uh, come back with an answer. Prepared. But I'm prepared. Well, that's wonderful. So first of all, there's no clear history on it. Um, so that's part of the problem. But rumor has it that a local professor uh, had a hand in it, uh, Professor Penny Pickle, if you can believe that. Uh, <laughs> when he was building the workshop with his uh, little mouse beaker, uh, he would play in the parking lot. And it, Penny Pickleball didn't sort of roll off the tongue, so they shortened it to Pickleball. Uh, the more you know. I like it. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. You know what? You just created a whole urban legend here tonight. Yeah. So. Thank you for Update that. Update the Wikipedia page later. Good. <laughs> It'll show up in a book someday. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. City manager's report. Mr. Butler. <laughs> Nothing tonight, sir. All right. Mr. City attorney. No report tonight. Great. So I guess that concludes our meeting. We will adjourn to uh, March 13th, 2018. Thanks so much. In the name of Ruth in, in Cheshire, the, friend yes. of the city. Thank, Thank you, Marianne. Thank you.